Kunal Jain, who's going to moderate our panel on discussions of trends and evolutions in angel investment. Dan Foots fr from Hutchinson. Iqbal Mamdani from First Investment. And Chris Tanner, who is our resident patent lawyer on this uh, panel. Welcome everybody again, and this is this is the last session. I'm I'm proud to be here, and I tell you, uh, each of the person who is sitting here, I have been working very closely, and especially Iqbal, my friend. Um, he was the first person. He was the actually second person who wrote a check for charter membership to Thai six years ago, and I even didn't know him. He. He lives in Naples, and he just heard about Thai from somewhere online or something, and he became a charter member at that time. And in the last six years, I think he has never attended any Thai meeting. <laughs> but we, we met twice, uh, once in Naples. I visited Naples, and then second time, well, he came, uh, we had some conversation. But it was a, every time I, I had to speak to him over the phone or I met him, it was uh, such an amazing learning for me with, through his experience and uh, the way he works. Uh, he works with Tamiami Angel Fund. He invests uh, uh, into startups uh, in Tamiami Angel Fund. And also, he has a company, uh, as a global company, which he's going to talk about in a little bit. Um, a lot of lessons to learn. So today, my job, uh, you know, I was uh, thinking about it. Uh, we were not prepared for this session. Actually, I was not prepared for the session. I was thinking that somebody else will moderate it. But I think this is, uh, I'm, I'm anyway going to do it. Uh, you know, the thing we heard all day that what entrepreneurs need or, you know, investors need or startups need. So here is my analogy. Startups or entrepreneurs need three things. You need an investor. We have it right here. You need an attorney. We have two, Dan and uh, Chris. And I'm going to, and then the third thing which I really, really feel I start up or entrepreneur need a catalyst. And you know, that's where I find myself and there are a lot of people in this room who are really, really acting as a catalyst. And there are people like incubators, accelerators, people who are running those accelerators. They are the real, real catalyst in the community who are supporting startups, not just by getting the money, getting the investment, but getting the right advice, mentoring, networking, all of these tools. So we have everybody sitting here, and um, Dan, I'll give a little uh, you know, introduction about Dan. He has been supporting our fund from the day one, and all of his services he has been giving for free. For the last past one year, Dan and his company, Hutchison Incorporation, <laughs> Uh, they have actually done due diligence over 20 startups we have, uh, you know, reviewed in past one year, and out of those, we have invested into eight of them. Um, I'm going to uh, give a little update about our fund, because this is the fund which we introduced last year in, in the last Tycon, and uh, we announced $2 million fund, but we ended up collecting $3 million. So it was, a, you know, a wonderful start last year. And out of that, we collected the checks. The minimum check we collected was 25,000 from each investor. We have got 35 investors from the, our community. And a lot of these investors you are going to see, you are going to see during the program in the evening. A lot of them are charter members. Um, we have over $1.2 million deployed so far in last one year. Uh, total number of startups, we have funded 10. We just uh, signed up, we just put money into two more startups last week. Um, other funds we have collaborated with, Tamiya Angel Fund, which Iqbal introduced, we, we collaborate with them. Florida funders, anybody from Florida funders here today? Uh, huh? Brian is here, but he's not here. Okay. So we, we, we have collaborated with local funds as well. So we are not competing with any funds. We collaborate with them. We, we see the deals. We do the due diligence together, find the subject matter experts, and then, then invest together. So here is a, is a great opportunity for the community, and I think we have created that opportunity through Thai platform in last one year. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Iqbal to just share his story as an investment banker and how he entered into this field, because this is going to be a very you know, casual talk. So Iqbal, please. Thank you very much, Kunal. So I'll just uh, start by 
giving you a small story of where are you from. So I spent uh, about 35 years in the Middle East. I was based in Bahrain. And I used to go to Saudi Arabia quite often. So one day I was uh, just checking out from Ritz Carlton and I was waiting for my transport to pick me up to take me to the airport. And there was this uh, doorman who looked at me because I was sitting down and he came to me and said, sir, uh, sorry, he said, sir, where are you from? So I said, uh, I'm coming from Bahrain. He said, okay, okay. So he just went up and he came back after five minutes and he says, you know what, sir, but where are you really from? I said, well, I'm, I'm a United States citizen. Said, oh, okay. So he went back again and after a few minutes he came back again and said, but where were you really born? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I was born in Africa. So said, oh, then how he got confused, he went back again and he said, sir, can you really, t where, where, where are you really from? <laughs> I said, well, my grandfather came from India. Now he was happy that he finally <laughs> found someplace. So, so my story is that I was born in Africa. I was educated partly in Japan. I got my undergraduate degree in, in, in J Japanese university. Then I came to this country, went to University of California in Berkeley. I then had a small stint with United Nations Development Program in New York. And after that, I joined American Express Bank. I was initially uh, involved with developing their business uh, for Japanese business, and that was the right time because I came in around 1970, and a lot of Japanese companies were coming into into the United States. And with my knowledge of Japan I w and the Japanese language, I was able to develop a lot of business. Then in October 73, the whole world changed because what happened, the price of oil went up, every financial institution in the United States wanted to go to the Middle East to sort of recycle those petrodollars. And uh, my chairman of the bank asked me that since we do not have any Arabs uh, at a official, at a management level, you are at least a Muslim, so maybe you're halfway there. <laughs> so, 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 so why don't you go and, uh, and see what we can do? I said, well, I've never been to the Middle East. He said, well, just try it. So that's the story of my uh, really banking career in terms of Middle East. I set up all the operations of Middle East uh, for American Express. Uh, we started in Lebanon, we were in Jordan, we set up a joint venture bank in, in, in Egypt, we were in Bahrain, in Dubai, and we were just about to sign a joint venture agreement with uh, the Shah of Persia's Falawi Foundation at the time, you know, then Khomeini took over in 1978. Well, so I did all this business and I thought, you know, with the Indian blood in me that, you know, we need to be entrepreneurs. So if I do all these things and I set up all this business and make all the money for American affairs, I should do something for myself. So I set up an investment bank in Bahrain in 1979. At that time, the central bank told me, which was at that time called Bahrain Monetary Agency, that you need $10 million. Now in 79, $10 million is a lot of money. So I said, well, I'll be my own investment banker, and I went to Saudi Arabia and went to all the clients which I was dealing business with and raised that $10 million. And I'll just now fast forward because it's a long time. So I became an investment banker. I set up investment bank in Bahrain, then eventually we second was one in Turkey, I was in India uh, and in Central Asia, and after running for 35 years, I sold uh, the controlling interest in 2007 to uh, Dubai Holdings, which is owned by the Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai. So that's sort of my story in terms of where I got to the investment. <laughs> yes, I was very lucky, thank God, <laughs> because if it was 2008, things would have been much more difficult. Uh, tell something, uh, I'll come back to you yeah. about the India company. Then, um, uh, can you just... Uh, Sorry, you want to ask? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, go. Oh, you want me to? Okay, so I just want, we want, please tell them about your current India company and Tammy Amy Angel Fund and what you're doing and how you were hooked okay. up to the startup. So, so part of the thing, when we sold the bank to Dubai Holdings, they, sev they had several large uh, IT companies. So they did not want some of the private equity investment that we had made. It's actually me. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I've turned off my telephone, but my... My watch. watch. We, are, we are into connected devices. 
<laughs> so uh, they did not want to take five companies that were small IT companies in the United States. So what I did is I put these five companies together and reverse merged them into a publicly traded company in India, which is now called MindTech. So we are be beginning to develop this business, and we have uh, uh, several large customers uh, in, in, in the United States, and we have four offices now in the United States. We are in Singapore, we are in the UK, and we are in Bahrain doing Middle East business. So what was the second question? How, how did you hook up to the Penny and Yunjin? Okay. You the so after I sold my, my business, uh, let, let me tell you one other thing. So our model was that uh, as, as, as my investment bank, we always work with other partners. In other words, we were the source of capital, and we thought that you know, we really cannot go into India or Turkey or come to the United States and invest in something where we really don't have knowledge. Our knowledge was really more based on raising money. So we always partnered with somebody else. So our idea was that, uh, so we, for example, in India, we did the private equity fund in 2004 with four large partners, ILFS, uh, uh, Life Insurance Company of India, and Punjab National Bank. And we ran it for about eight years, and we all exited, and in terms of U.S. dollar, because it was established in 2004, in U.S. dollar terms, our IRR was 25%. So when I sort of semi-retired after I sold my interest, uh, I decided that I would use the same uh, formula in working with other partners. So I decided that if I wanted to work in, in Naples, there was a pool, you know, Naples has a fantastic pool of people who are retired CEO and CFOs. And they have a lot of money, and they are sitting there, and they wanted to invest in something. So the Tamiami Fund first was started, I think, about seven years ago. Tamiami Second was established four years ago, in which I participated, and Tamiami Three was established just two years ago, in which I think you are also a partner, and I'm also a partner. So totally, we have, a, we have invested about $10 million in angel fund. The last one, Tamiami 3, is 5.6 million, which I'm told is sort of the largest angel fund in Florida. Uh, and so that is by my involvement. We have 40 uh, shareholders of this fund. Our administrator sees about 100 new uh, uh, projects that come in. They screen them down to about four, and every month we have a meeting where the CEO or the promoters come and present these four. Then based on the total voting of all the members, if, if there is a majority approval, then we go through the due diligence process. And the important, interesting thing is that most of the investors in our fund really get onto the due diligence team. And, and that gives us additional confidence. And many times we find invariably people who get on the on the uh, due diligence team, they also then put add-on investment into the, into the fund. And that is additional confidence for us. And then they get on to the board because some of the promoters are really, maybe they're entrepreneurs, but they don't have the financial tools to run the company. So these uh, board members help them because these board members have no other objective but to make sure that the company is successful. So that model, I think, has is, is really been very effective and working very well. Perfect, perfect. So this is what we are going to do. We, we ask everybody to have six to seven minutes of their conversation and talks what, you know, value addition. So Dan, thank you very much for everything you did for our fund. And uh, I would like to understand one thing about the difference between, you know, how do you see the trends between committed capital, angel funds, and traditional angel master networks? Like, is there any you know, how are you seeing those trains? I would like to touch upon some of the points, and then I would also ask a follow-up question. Uh, actually, it was a, I, I met somebody who, who invests into CDs A and beyond. Mm -hmm. They don't invest into an angel level, and I was just talking to him. He's my gym buddy. He comes in. He said, hey, nobody makes money in a startup capital. Nobody makes money in angel funding. <laughs> we, you know, people stopped doing that long time ago. Well, you need to invest 50 million and more. So, you know, one of these things people have, that thing in their mindset. So, so give us some examples. Talk about it because you have been, you know, investing. Both you have been helping 
both uh, startup angel investors and, you know. Yeah, so I, I think in terms of trends, there has been a little bit of a trend more towards a committed capital angel fund, which is, you know, typically there's someone who's running the fund, the funds are all put in, they're all committed, and then the LPs don't have as much of a say as Tammy Amy. They wouldn't vote on the individual investments. Um, that's replacing, to some extent, um, the angel networks where the entrepreneurs would come in, they'd pitch to the angel group, and then each individual investor would make their own decision as to whether or not they wanted to participate. They'd write their own check, they'd invest in their own name, sometimes they'd form an LLC to do that, but it was a very individualized process. And I think what the reason for that is largely because of technology. And now it's easier and you can be more cost efficient and you can drive costs down to running a $2 million, $3 million, $5 million fund without the typical 20% carry, you know, 2% management fee because 2% on $5 million, you're trying to run a fund with, you know, $100,000 or $10,000. I'm not, math is not a lawyer's strong suit. So uh, it's not enough to hire the right investment professionals and, and get people on board. Um, as to your gym buddies comment, I guess <laughs> for, for the investors and the entrepreneurs, I think it's important to remember that angel funding is, uh, it, it's not philanthropy, right. um, you know, people might take a bit of a reduced view as to what their expectations are in returns as opposed to the traditional VC model, but it is a form of investing and there is an expectation on the investor's part that you're going to be a good steward of their money as the entrepreneur, that you're gonna use it to advance the company and that you're going to give them returns. Uh, and so, you know, friends and family, that's more philanthropy a lot of the time, uh, but, but I think your your gym buddy buddy is um, a little bit off the mark. There are a lot of people in angel investing that that are doing it truly as an investment and are seeing good returns. So uh, when you when the, this is like we saw that uh, even you know few people even Dr. Duwedi you've talked about a strategic investment when you you have to find the right kind of investor, not any kind of money. So how do you see and how do you protect your investors when, you know, when the startups are like dying for money? They, they just don't care. At that time, the only mindset they have is, I need funding or else I will die. So, I mean, how do they shatter that kind of mentality in order to make the right decision at that time? I know in some of the deals, uh, you have protected us and you, you said red flag and we did not move ahead. But when it comes to the startup, because for him, it's like an immediate goal is to get that funding. Well, I, I think it all goes back to understanding what you're using the money for. A and what you want to have is a good partner who's providing that capital to you. And if you're just taking money from anyone, um, you know, even in success stories, there's follow on investment. There's additional asks for money. And, and what you don't want to have is someone on your cap table who is no longer on board with what the company's doing or might act as an impediment to those future rounds of financing. Especially at the angel stage, it's very hard to raise enough money, and quite honestly, you shouldn't be trying to raise all the money that you need to get to the exit because you're not going to get a great valuation on that money, and I assume that's why even though they were offering you $22 million, you only wanted 15 because you didn't want to give that extra $7 million at that, at that valuation. And so it's important to remember that as the companies progress through their life cycle, the value of the company should hopefully be increasing. And so that next seven, 10, $15 million might be on double the valuation and you're, only, you're, giving, up less of the, you're giving up less dilution to take that in. Wonderful, wonderful. So Chris Tanner is a patent attorney, and I, I actually happened to meet him uh, la like when we had a last time meeting, and I got an opportunity to speak to him for a few minutes. He has an amazing insight about uh, why we need a patent, and I, by the way, I tell you, I have never understood patents, so we would really like your insight for the next five, six minutes to understand why, do, why should we search for patent, and at what point of time we really 
need to understand that my business model or my product or my service need a patent. You know, this is really, we, we you know, as some of entrepreneurs or startup enthusiasts, they would like to know what, what it is. I mean, why do we need it? Okay, I'm going to start with the fact that I was an examiner at the U.S. Patent Office. I know what the examiners do. Also, um, I majored in electrical engineering and physics, and math is uh, an important suit for that, even though I am an attorney. Um, but thank you for mentioning that, and, and no disrespect intended. Uh, but one of the issues is how wildly people misunderstand the value of a prior art search and overstate it. In the vast majority of cases, they overstate what is meant by a prior art search. First of all, I can tell you, as a patent examiner, we would utterly and completely ignore the prior art search that you have your attorney do before you file. We disregard it entirely, have no use whatsoever for it. And notice the second part, not to pick at your semantics, Kunal, but I wrote this on purpose when I submitted that question to you. It's not a patent search. It's a prior art search, and there's a big difference. As an examiner, we would look at YouTube, we would look at um, Amazon and Google and find all kinds of other instances of relevant things in your field, some of which may be patents, but in my prior art searches, it would only be about half. And in a lot of cases, the applicant would submit back and say, look, you know, my attorney did a prior art search. Come on, hurry up and give me the patent. I'd say, look, I found 19 different references, some of them patents, some of them not. I'm not granting an allowance on this. I don't care what your attorney said. And in the vast majority of cases, I get clients after their second or third patent attorney, and they say, my first one insisted that I do this complex search and spend a significant amount of money on it. And I will say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry he charged you for that. And it's usually a he. Most patent attorneys are male. And most patent attorneys are pretty good at math. <laughs> um, and in general, they're no help whatsoever. And Kunal, do you mind so, if I stand up for a second? Oh, absolutely. If there's one thing I would want you folks to remember, if you want a patent, the key, single, number one factor is the depth of your disclosure. At least 20 pages of detailed description and at least 15 drawings. Your odds of getting a patent, even on something trivial, that has been done many times. I do a lot of toilet seats and I get a lot of patents. If you give a large disclosure, more than 20 pages and more than 15 pages of drawings, your chances of getting a patent go up. And it's the disclosure, not the search. Excellent, excellent. But you know, when, when we evaluate the priorities like, as a startup, you see like the first priority we say, okay, we, we need customers, we need our product. And then in the last, it comes that, oh, I have to pay a fee to an attorney, and especially patent attorney. So when, in, in that cycle, when you see, you know, for the startups and entrepreneurs, I mean, those who are, they may not have that kind of money. So what are the resources? Do you have any resources which are, like, available as a pro bono or as, like, through universities or some of, like, the IP firms where we can... I do participate. They can, they can get these kind of resources for free. Sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. I do participate in the Florida, what's known as a pro bono, but in Florida we call it the flow bono program for helping inventors with limited capital. But the best example by far, every single PowerPoint I saw today, they could have just submitted that, put it into PDF format, uploaded it for $70, seven zero, and they would have been patent pending. You don't need an attorney at all. And I put on my website an explicit portion on tannerpatent.com. The middle button is how to file your own patent application yourself without an attorney at all. I repeat, without an attorney. So this idea that, you know, spending major coin with attorneys, I run into that so much. And it's such a canard, such a mistake, such an unwise business practice, and so unnecessary. Wonderful. Now that that's that's some amazing insight. Uh, if so, I can tell you we can hear a lot of stories from these people. I know everybody. Now we have a second set of people, probably some, who has just joined us. Some people did not attend the all-day event, but now they are attending the evening event. So, how much time we have? We have to close like before six or. 
10 minutes. Okay, I can just ask one question which is very, very relevant in, in you know, and all of you can answer that. When, uh, when you do the investing, and this is my experience in the last one year, when I go to investors or talk to rich people around you know, our friend circle, the way they invest, the first question they ask, have you invested into this? I said, here is an opportunity. I said, okay, have you invested into this? Or whom do you know who has invested into this? Are you going to make money into this? So the mindset is you just follow the one rich investor who has already made an exit and <laughs> made a home run. Um, I know this may not be the right mindset, but I really want uh, you know at least you both of you to make a comment like, is this a right mindset? Or if somebody really need to invest into the startup, what kind of you know philosophy he should follow? If he's a part of a fund, which is good that you know he's putting a money and you know forget about it. But what do, what do you think about it? So in t in terms of uh, uh, angel investing, as I said, I go with Miami uh, Tamiami Miami. fund, which they have a they do due diligence, and I know that who are people who are on the due diligence are sitting around the table with me when we are asking questions. So I have a little bit of confidence in them. But at the end of the day, you know, as as a person, you have to look at it and see whether it's the jockey and the horse. You know, yeah. you know, you have to look at both. And I think you need really a, a very sturdy jockey, you know, and who is also a little bit hungry, and a sturdy horse. If that <laughs> if that doesn't work, then I think it's very difficult for me. Of course, you know. From the others, just from a regulatory point of view, you also want to be to know, especially if you're looking at international investment, that who are you, who are your partners? Because you know, with this KYC information, you know your customer. You don't want to be associated with people that you really don't know. Who are your co-investors? So I've been very careful about that in investing because I do invest in India, I do invest in in Europe, and also, of course, in the United States. So that's also another important issue for me. Very good, Jan. Uh, yeah, I would say invest in things that you have knowledge about or you know people and trust people who have knowledge about it. And then I would, I would agree. I think it's, it's the team. I, I hear investors all the time say, I don't care about what their idea is. I believe in this entrepreneur. I believe in this team. And even if they need to pivot, which they probably will, um, I think they can get this done and get something out into the marketplace. So I think as an entrepreneur, you should think about how you're presenting yourself, how you're presenting your team, why everyone is on that team, and what they're adding to the, to the, to the process. And then get out in the community and talk with investors before you need money. A lot of people, and especially a lot of the funds, say, I knew this entrepreneur two years ago before they ever needed the money. And you kn they know you, they get to know where you are in the life cycle, they've seen you have some issues and get over them, and so that's how you build the trust and that's how you build um, a rapport with the investors so that you're not just showing up when you need their money and they don't know if you'll be there th three months from now. And so that's how, you know, you can follow the rich guy, but rich people make mistakes too. <laughs> yeah. uh, and but would you share any success, recent success story you have closed, or, or Mr. Mamdani, I would like you to share any success stories where you would really like to? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll share a story about uh, where we were not very successful. So we invested in Turkey in a private equity deal uh, into a company called Emson, which, which had 40% of market share of making pots and pans, you know, and... Uh, pressure cookers and something like that. So our due diligence team went there and they studied the market and they checked out everything and we invested in that company. Well, uh, we did everything, but you know, we, I think our team did not look at the international competition in terms of where, what could impact this, this market. So after about a year and a half, we found out that the Chinese manufacturer could produce and sell into Turkey a pressure cooker, for example, at the price that we were buying the commodities like steel and aluminum in the marketplace, in the world <laughs> market. So there was no way that we can compete with that. And so it became very difficult for us, you know, especially during the time when Turkish economy was going down, we had inflation problem, the interest rate were very high. So we had to change our course and uh, what we decided that we went to uh, a Chinese manufacturer 
and we gave him the specification of what we wanted. They also, so they were able to manufacture according to our, our, our specification, put our brand name on it, even print the instructions in Turkish, but in, uh, in China, and they were able to arrange all the logistic support. So they were able to send, let's say, two containers to Izmir, right out, outside of China, which is very difficult. So we found that that model, eventually, it was very difficult for us. So, so that was not a very successful <laughs> investment because we didn't really figure out that you know, Chinese could just, no matter how insulated the Turkish market was, that we will not be able to succeed. Dan, do you have a success story to share? Uh, yeah, uh, one of our clients, uh, they started in about three years ago. Uh, they had, it was an academic founder and a Stanford MBA got together and they basically replicated what something they were doing um, in the uh, big pharma space, which they had been doing as a nonprofit without any kind of business bent. And so the pharma companies would come in, sponsor data collection, and then join a consortium and, and collect all of that data back. And so if anyone's familiar with pharma, phase four is post-marketing kind of studies where which have become kind of very important to the FDA recently. They want a lot of phase four data even after you're in the market. And so what we did is we set up a company around that. Uh, it was a new product in the marketplace, took in $2 million of investment, uh, and we're currently negotiating their exit uh, for, you know, low nine figures. And so uh, that, that's a good thing. Well, so you, yeah, that, that, that's a very good story. Anybody has any question? I mean, I, I, I know we are running short of time. We have five minutes, two minutes, three minutes. But whoever wants to, yeah. Um, as we see, pretty much the appetite around here is for, for, for digital technology. And everybody, and health. You mentioned that in Turkey, you, you actually invested in something doing manufacturing. Yes. Uh, if you look back at the history of this country, we were a manufacturing country that that's where we built our economy on. And now China's building their economy on manufacturing. And this catching up with us. So your question should not take more than a 30 seconds. Do you see other things other than digital technology in the future of your funds? Well, I think if I uh, specifically refer to the Tamiami Angel Fund and I look at the deal flow that's coming, I would say 60% is related to technology. So I'll say, having worked with um, Tim Cartwright and Tammy Angel Fund, if you watch HGTV and there's a company on there that's out of UF called Fracture, I saw them pitch for the first time before they went to the fund, and it is so cool. And they're a product company. They're a product company. So I think um, one of the things we talk about is that uh, working with um, startups is like working with this old house. And almost everybody looks good on a pitch deck, but if you knew what went on in the back room and what they see, um, there's a reason why some companies don't get funded. And there are, there are things about money, but um, Rich, there's, if we look around the room, people that are investors, is there plenty of money here? So yeah. let me see, these are the companies where we invested in 2017. Uh, in one year. In one year, we, we, we funded like almost Ten companies. Uh, the last two ones are the recent one. Uh, one is Morphogenic, is a biopharma. The next one is a fin. Uh, Finexio is a fintech company. Anupam Rasan is an India-based manufacturing company. Uh, Catalyst Orthoscience, it's a it's a medical device company. Uh, Droplet is IoT. Uh, Molecule, you you must have seen the product outside. Uh, Software Automation is an Atlanta-based company. Uh, again, through Thai. Uh, I mean, most of the connections we made through Thai Network. Uh, Pick My Kid is a local company, and Doctable uh, is a San Antonio-based company. NAC is, again, Florida, Tampa, Tampa Bay Wave company. So the, the whole purpose was, you know, to start last year, this is to basically synergize uh, the local economy and how to support it. So, so here is, uh, so these are the action heroes, and uh, I would, I think, end up here, and uh, we are going to have a wonderful evening. You would see some uh, action outside from the uh, now, and 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 then we'll have an evening event later. Bye. So, on that note about money and entrepreneurs, 
um, if you weren't here when I said the story about how the fund was started last year, um, that first two million plus was raised on a Saturday evening. Um, in any community where you can raise $2 million in less than two and a half hours, I would say there's money. We need to organize it, and we need entrepreneurs and investors that are both better organized. You can be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, so let's go make a change and enjoy our happy hour now. <laughs>